thank you guys for coming out this morning. It's not definitely a morning you'd rather stay in bed, I'm sure, but thank you for being here. Um, maybe let's just start with a quick prayer. <laughs> thank you, God, that we are gathered here this morning to worship you and to hear your word. And just pray this morning that this message is your message and that people be drawn in as you already know is best. Thank you. Amen. Awesome. So this morning we're going to um, look at the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son. And parables were um, ways that Jesus taught. They were what seemed to be simple stories that conveyed a deep message about um, eternal kingdom truths. And so this morning we're going to read, I'm going to read the parable of the prodigal son, and you can follow along if you like, it is written in your program, or just take this time to listen. Now, I'm sure many of us, or some of us, have probably heard this story a number of times, and I would just encourage us this morning to take note of where we're being drawn into the story today, and where we may resonate um, even if you have heard this story a number of times, I find each time I hear it that I'm often drawn to different places. And I think there's times when we can connect to all three of the main characters in the story. So that being the father, the younger son, or the older son. So as I read it, just um, take note of where you're resonating this morning. So I'm going to be reading from the message, and this is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Then he said, and that would be Jesus, so Jesus said, there was once a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, father, I want right now what's coming to me. So the father divided the property between them. It wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a distant country. There, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. After he had had gone through all his money, there was a bad famine all through the country, and he began to hurt. He signed on with a citizen there who assigned him to his fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry he would have eaten the corn cobs in the pig's slop, but no one would give him any. That brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day, and here I am starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and went home to his father. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His heart pounding, he ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God, and I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to the servants. Quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a grain-fed heifer and roast it. We're going to have a feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive, given up for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. All this time, the older son was out in the fields. When the day's work was done, he came in. As he approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing. Calling over one of the houseboys, he asked what was going on. He told him, your brother came home. Your father has ordered a feast, barbecued beef, because he has him home safe and sound. The older brother stalked off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, Look, how many years I've stayed here serving you, never giving you one moment of grief. But have you ever thrown a party for me and my friends? 
Then this son of yours who has thrown away your money on whores shows up and you go, out, you go all out with a feast. His father said, son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time and everything that is mine is yours. But this is a wonderful time and we had to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he is found. Where did you find yourself being drawn into the story today? Are you connecting with the lost son? Are you ready to just collect all your belongings and take off to a distant land? Or have you already done that and you're in a time of preparing your speech? You want to come home. Or maybe you've recently come home and you're humbled by the vast love that surrounds you. Are you connecting with the Father this morning who is waiting and wondering where his lost son or daughter is? Or do you have a son or daughter who has recently come home and you're in a time of celebration and it's a wonderful time? Are you connecting with the older son who has never gone astray but feels neglected and forgotten? Love feels far from you. You feel angry and alone. What's important to note is that this parable is actually part of three parables found in Luke chapter 15. And most experts on Luke would agree that the three parables should really be told as a unit. At the beginning of Luke chapter 15, it explains that Jesus is teaching to tax collectors and sinners, those who are lost, who are broken and far from God. The Pharisees, who were the teachers and the leaders um, of the law during the time of Jesus, are grumbling. They disapprove that Jesus is hanging out with such people. So Jesus tells three parables to teach that the lost people are also welcomed by Christ and equally valuable to God. As we recognize the unity of these parables, we could also ask ourselves, do we resonate more with the sinners or with the Pharisees? So in the unit, the first parable is of the lost sheep. A man who had a hundred sheep discovered one was missing, so he left the 99 and went looking for the lost sheep. When he found the lost sheep, he threw it over his shoulders and brought it home. He called his friends and they began to celebrate. There was more rejoicing over one lost sheep than, than the other 99 who didn't need finding. And here Jesus was emphasizing that there is rejoicing in heaven when a sinner repents and the one lost sheep represents the sinners and the other 99, the Pharisees, who don't believe that they need to repent. Sadly, spiritual pride creates blind spots. And then the next parable is of a woman who has 10 coins and she loses one of those coins. And so she starts searching diligently around the house for it. She sweeps the house, she lights a candle, looks under every nook and cranny until she finds it. And she does find it and she puts it back where it belongs. She calls her neighbors and they celebrate. Again, this is a similar message to the first parable, but it emphasizes Jesus wants to emphasize here that the sinners are also extremely valuable to God. And then is the parable of the lost son. Probably the most popular of all three parables. And as we just read, Jesus describes the two sons. And the younger represents the sinners and the older represents the Pharisees. In both cases, we see how the father responds to his children both are invited to share in a meal, and both are invited to the kingdom of God. God does not exclude either of them. And so no matter where we find ourselves resonating with the story today, we can rest assured that God is inviting us, and he wants to respond to us with an invitation of love. 
Now, what's also interesting about these three parables, um, when the sheep goes lost, the shepherd goes and finds it. And when a coin is lost, the woman looks very diligently for it. And when the human being goes astray and is lost, the father stays home and he waits. Why does the father stay home and wait? Isn't a human being as important and helpless as a lost sheep or as valuable as a lost coin? What's also revealed to us in these three parables is the heart of God. In the story of the prodigal son, we also see God as a heavenly parent. Just as a father patiently waits for his son, God shows us the same patience as he waits for us when we're lost. Now, personally, I'm a type A personality, so patience is not one of my virtues. So when I read this and I start to understand the patience of God, I'm quite humbled by this. Certainly not an easy task. As the father is quick to celebrate the return of the lost son, God is also quick to rejoice and sing with us when we finally turn to him and come home. He doesn't get mad or make us feel bad about ourselves. Instead, he loves us. And he wants to show us his love. So why does God choose to wait? Why? He doesn't push, he doesn't run after us, but why is that? It's fully within his power to do so. I would suggest that he knows our human condition and probably, or he does, know us more than we know ourselves. He knows if he pushes, the chances are we'll keep running. And this doesn't mean that as he waits, he isn't guiding and revealing himself to us. But he is waiting for us to turn to him. He's waiting for our speech, so to say, so to speak. Although he doesn't need to hear it, and he's not going to listen to it too much. Um, really what he's doing is waiting to celebrate with us. And as soon as we turn, the celebration begins. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. As I contemplated this idea of waiting in my own life, I came to realize that I often think I'm waiting on God. Um, I don't often think that he's waiting for me. There have been times in my life when the pain of waiting on God has been heart-wrenching and debilitating. I don't know if any of you have ever felt that pain, that grip at your heart, like you're frozen in time, you're lost. You're not knowing what to do next, and you're pleading with God to show you, to tell you. I've said many times in my life, I wish God would just stand in front of me and tell me what to do. I don't want to wait anymore. But this morning, even just for a moment, let's consider that instead of us waiting on God, maybe God is waiting on us. Let's ask ourselves, have we fully turned towards him? Are we walking in his direction? Are our hearts and minds fully engaged and attentive to and living in submission for him? The parable of the lost son is a parable of the son's repentance and the father's forgiveness. So I thought it would be fun this morning to do a little exercise, a little word study. Um, this is actually taken from one of my seminary courses this semester, and so I um, have to give credit to Professor Choi for this. Um, it's, we're going to do a word study on the word repent, and we're going to look at the various ways it's been defined and described. So the act of repenting, turning one's heart towards God. We're just going to see how that has um, transitioned over time. 
So in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for repent is shuv, or naham. Shuv is used more often. And what that means is it's a physical turning. It's a physical turning towards a place, towards home. And naham is more of an emotional response. It means to feel remorse for, to feel remorse for something. So there's both a physical and an emotional element here. Now, when the word was translated uh, into Greek, the New Testament, its meaning didn't change, but there was a slight change in nuance. So metanote is the word in Greek, and what this actually means is to change one's mind. So in this case, there's a highly cognitive element to what it means to repent. And then in the 4th century, the scripture was translated into Latin, and this was called the Vulgate, and it was translated, translated as penitentium agite. Agite means to do penitentium is um, penance. So we're to do penance. Again, going back to a more physical uh, state of doing a physical action. And then finally, in the 16th century, century, a man by the name of Erasmus, who was a humanist, um, that means he believed in going back to the original source when discovering meaning. He translated the word repent to resipiscate, and this deals more with the condition of one's heart. It means to be penitent. Again, a more emotional response. So why go through an exercise like this? Um, I think what this shows is that to repent involves all of who we are. The whole self. It's a physical, mental, it involves our physical, mental, emotional, and our spiritual being. God is waiting for us to turn our whole selves towards him. I've come to realize in my own life that the pain of waiting is often because I haven't turned my whole self towards him. This isn't just a wholehearted turning. It's a giving for, of all for all. When we fully repent, all of life becomes God's. And this has never been more apparent to me than in, than in my life right now. Um, just over 20 years ago, I felt a deep calling to go into the ministry, to formally work in the church. And at 13 years old is when I had this, the start of this calling. Now, obviously, he wasn't asking me to do that at 13 years old, but he did ask. And in that moment, I experienced God's presence so fully that it's been one of those moments that has defined me. I was at a summer Bible camp, and after one of the evening chapel services, um, I went to the front and prayed with some of the counselors and leaders, and my friend came with me. And during that time of prayer, um, I asked Jesus into my heart. At 13, I understood I had desired a relationship with Jesus. Um, I understood he was waiting for me and that I was now in a place to repent and give myself to him. After that time of prayer, we went outside and went to the bonfire where all the other campers were. And one of the counselors got up and said, if anyone's accepted Jesus into their heart tonight, please raise your hand or say it out loud. Well... I gulped. I didn't know I was going to have to tell anybody. I felt very uncomfortable. And I just sat there. I didn't really want to say anything. But other people did. They raised their hands and, you know, said that they had accepted Jesus into their heart. And as I sat there, very uncomfortable, I began to heat up. And what felt like an eternity, but was probably seconds or moments, maybe some minutes went by, there was a ball of fire in my gut burning so intensely 
and it burned right up through me out of into my throat and out as I quite loudly yelled I accepted Jesus into my heart tonight and then I was a little bit shocked and maybe a bit embarrassed just because of the way it happened um, but I also felt an immense sense of peace so without knowing what had really happened um, I knew that it was of God So the next morning I spoke to my camp counselor about it and she um, explained to me more about the Holy Spirit and what that meant. And then I shared with her this fear that had come from that moment. Ever since that moment I had sensed that deep calling um, in my life of going into ministry. And understand at the time my dad was in seminary so I was kind of living out that life. and. To be honest, it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> um, I saw what my dad was going through, and it was, it was a lot of sacrifice, and it was certainly not an easy calling. So I really didn't want God to be asking me to do the same thing. Fortunately, um, the counselor reassured me that if that was God's desire for me, that he would settle those fears, and those fears would turn to joy, and that... Um, he would make it very clear that that was what I was supposed to do. So I thought, okay, well, that's good. I don't have to do anything now. And um, so I waited. And for 20 years I waited. And I thought, well, if this is really what he wants me to do, he'll make it apparent. Now, what's so amazing is that like the story of the prodigal son, God didn't push. He waited. He knows me better than I know myself. Like a good parent, he knew that if he pushed too hard and too fast, I would keep running and I maybe would never turn back. In his infinite wisdom, he also knew when I would turn and when the perfect time would be. And it was just before my daughter was born, about three years ago now, that that deep sense of calling came back, like a fire in my gut, like it had 20 years earlier. I was, at that time, I was disgruntled with my current career, and I was searching and longing um, for the next step and asking God to show me that. Now, keep in mind, I was also nine months pregnant, so I had to discern whether that was hormonal or real. But um, I did begin discerning, and... It was really brought on by a, 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 I began to hurt. Like the prodigal son, I began to hurt, and I was looking towards home for help. So I started testing these feelings by talking to my family, to Pastor John, Pastor Heather, and other confidants in my life. It was then, when God could see me from far away, that he began running. He embraced me, and he kissed me, and he began preparing the celebration. God started opening up doors, like here at New Hope Church, where I could try out what it meant to preach. I started looking at schools, and it just so happened that the perfect program was available where I could stay here in Calgary and be a mom and a wife and look after my responsibilities at my church and still start my Masters of Divinity. God even took care of the resources for the stu my studies. And I was granted a full ride paid for by our classes. Sorry. <laughs> the celebration had begun. God revealed to me through this journey his heart of patience and love beyond my human comprehension. Hence my emotions. <laughs> And I'm pregnant again. <laughs> so that could have something to do with it. So I guess the question that comes out of that for all of us today, is there a place in your life where you're waiting for God? Is it possible in that same place that God is waiting for you? 
Is something holding you back from turning your whole self to him? Throughout the message this morning, we've been looking at images from the painting of the prodigal son by Rembrandt, who is generally considered one of the greatest painters in European art history and certainly one of the most important in Dutch history. Henry Nouwen wrote a book entitled The Return of the Prodigal Son, a story of homecoming, and in the epilogue, Living the Painting, he writes, when I saw the Rembrandt poster for the first time in the fall of 1983, all my attention was drawn to the hands of the old father pressing his returning boy to his chest. I saw forgiveness, reconciliation, healing. I saw safety, rest, and being at home. I was so deeply touched by this image of the life-giving embrace of the father and son because everything in me yearned to be received in the same way the prodigal son was received. That encounter turned out to be the beginning of my own return. In the conclusion of the book, he goes on to say, although Rembrandt does not place the father in the physical center of the painting, it is clear that the father is the center of the event the painting portrays. From him comes all light. To him goes all attention. Rembrandt, faithful to the parable, intended that our primary attention go to the Father before anyone else. How can we as a church community support each other as we collectively learn to turn towards God and make sure our primary attention is on the Father? I certainly don't have the answers to those tough questions but I think perhaps a starting point is by faith and with lots of patience and most importantly, with love. Always remembering to celebrate and rejoice with our maker. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you long to rejoice with us that you are waiting for us. You are waiting for us so you can show us your love more fully than we can comprehend. Guide us as a church community as we focus our attention on you, as we turn to you yearning to be embraced by you and loved by you. Bless us today and always. In your holy name we pray. Amen.